the uh, the story of the bamboo tree it takes like years to to build the infrastructure and then in a matter of six months it shoots up 100 feet in the air bitcoin within the next 10 years is going to be priced in the millions that might be an underestimation of of how high this thing could actually go because we've never seen absolute scarcity before we've never seen the explosion of the current global debt economy when it's being pinned and gauged by an absolute fixed global decentralized digital asset. I was 100% in Bitcoin, but I still wanted to buy more Bitcoin. So I figured, you know what? The company has money. We have that number set, the six months working capital and anything beyond that, we just buy Bitcoin with it and send it to cold storage. Four years later, it has worked wonders for us. And it was probably the best decision we've ever done in our lives. Two businesses that are exactly the same. They bring in the exact same revenue, exact same profit margins. But one has shit ton of Bitcoin that they've accumulated over the years and one has no Bitcoin at all. Which one would you prefer? People in the West, Europe, North America, they live in this bubble and they think that, oh, everything that's happening over there, that's just over there. That could never happen to us. Before uh, we get started, for the people that don't know Tahinis, like myself a little bit because I'm in Europe, um, what is Tahinis? What are you doing? How big is it? What's, give the audience a little bit of a, a feeling what, what the size of the business and what the business is doing. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we are a uh, Canadian-based uh, franchise restaurant franchise company, and uh, we... Uh, opened our first restaurant in London, Ontario in 2012. Uh, from there, we started slowly uh, building the infrastructure of the franchise system. Uh, we expanded to two locations, then three, then four. Uh, in, in the year 2020, we were at, um, we were at three, and um, now we're at uh, 44 locations nationwide. Uh, so we got 44 locations um, in Canada across the country. Uh, so it's kind of like the uh, the story of the, the bamboo tree. It takes like years to, to build the infrastructure and then in a matter of six months, it shoots up like, you know, 100 feet in the air. Um, so that's kind of um, the story of the company. We serve uh, Middle Eastern uh, slash fusion food. Uh, so we make uh, mainly shawarmas, but we've also um, found a way to infuse other cultures uh, into our food. So for example, we have like a butter chicken shawarma, which is like, you know, Indian cuisine and Middle Eastern cuisine infused together. We have Jamaican jerk shawarma. Um, we have like crispy chicken shawarma sandwich, right? Uh, shawarma poutine. So uh, we figured out a way to to infuse other cultures, and which makes us unique, and uh, which gives us uh, the ability to create um, food products that are only exclusive to Tahinis and no one else. Um, which is one of the reasons why uh, people love our our food, and. Um, yeah, and then in the year of 2020, uh, we made a very bold move to um, put the company on a Bitcoin standard by putting our entire cash reserves into Bitcoin at that point. Um, so, yeah, and then fast forward four years, here we are today. Really, really cool. I love that. Um by the way, I like uh, I just got hungry. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> probably some some fuels. <laughs> you can grab something for food. I will I will grab something later. Um, uh, may, maybe we can do Anytime. a second round in a, a restaurant someday. Uh, would be a cool interview. Um, why did you decide to to do a Bitcoin standard? Although twenty twenty is an interesting time because yeah, like uh, probably at your place, uh, restaurants also were forced to close down. Uh, it's an interesting, uh, place to start with your Bitcoin journey. How was that time in general? And, and why did you then, uh, decide to put uh, Bitcoin on your balance sheet? Yeah. So it was an interesting time for us actually. So when 2020 hit, uh, we were fortunate enough, um, to be one of the businesses that, uh, wouldn't be forced to close down. 
uh, we closed down our dining area, but we were uh, able to keep uh, our takeout and delivery business still going. So uh, obviously within that first week of, of uh, the pandemic in March, uh, sales dropped like 80% in one week. Um, because of all the scare and everybody was afraid, nobody know, knew what was going on. And, and, uh, so did the market. And I was at the time a participating, uh, market player. And uh, I was, I had a lot of, you know, dry powder, uh, in my arsenal. So I decided to deploy that capital, uh, into just everything. So um, mainly stocks, I put a lot of money into stocks and, and then I just decided to put a little bit of money into Bitcoin as well. I've, at that point, I've heard it multiple times. I didn't really know what it was, but um, I just said, you know, why not? But then after I bought it, that's when the real journey started. I feel like that's where most people's journey start is after you buy it and then you start studying what it actually is deeply. Uh, you then, well, I, after that, I just got hooked down the rabbit hole and, um, it was like a, a three months obsessive phase of just, uh, consuming and, and learning and reading everything I can about Bitcoin. Uh, and then the more I read, the more I learned, the more books I read and podcasts I listened to, uh, the bigger my allocation personally was. So I kept like, and I ended up like selling all of my stocks, just buying more Bitcoin with it uh, until it was just, I was a hundred percent in Bitcoin. And at that point I was uh, out of money, but I still wanted to buy more Bitcoin. So I figured, you know what? The company has money and we have been saving some money as a treasury uh, in the company. And, you know, I talked to my partners, I was able to convince them to uh, put that money into Bitcoin. And it was, there were some debates going back and forth. And then Michael Saylor came out with his announcement when he did his first buy. Um, I can't remember the amount, I think it was like 125 million or, or something like that. And that announcement was what pushed us over the edge and we said you know what this is the right move to do so we jumped all in like a week after michael saylor announced his his buy and um we've been just buying ever since um we put a a pin t our, the pin tweet on our twitter account sort of explains the methodology behind why we did it uh, all the money printing, all the, you know, how money cash is eventually going to be worthless and, and the reasonings behind why we did that. And from there, we just kept buying in increments, uh, every month or every quarter, uh, a chunk of Bitcoin, adding it to our reserves. And that became our, um, Bitcoin, like our treasury strategy um, from that point on and four years later, it has worked wonders for us. And it was probably the best decision we've ever done in our lives. That's yeah, it. Uh, along the, the capital appreciation is, is, is massive since, since 2020. Um, I'm a little bit curious, uh, before we get into how and everything like that, um, what was the debates like with your partners? Do you mean with partners, the franchisees uh, that take the franchises or like from the business uh, investors or what was the partners and then how did those debates uh, go? Yeah, so no, by partners, I mean uh, the partners in, in the, like the, the franchise company, um, which is basically my brother and my cousin. Uh, we are three partners uh, running Tahini's and uh, I was the one that sort of discovered Bitcoin and I, you know, as I went down the rabbit hole, I pulled them down with me and I had them buy Bitcoin personally. And uh, from there, 
that's that's who the discussion wa- was with um the the franchisees themselves are almost like separate in a way uh, separate entities uh separate corporations than ours um so they have the decision they see what we do and they have the decision whether or not they want to buy or they don't want to buy um some of them do uh, buy bitcoin and, and earn it through um, like Bitcoin ATM machines and programs that we've developed. Uh, but, um, but mainly it's our, our franchise company, like the, the, the parent company. Ah, really, really cool. Uh, Bitcoin ETFs is an interesting one. I want to get to that later a little bit. Uh, before, how was that transitioning time? I guess like now it's an obvious choice. Uh, right now, like it's like, oh yeah, we do it now four years. It's a, it's, it's a great play. But how was it in the beginning? Was was that transitioning uh, with taxes, accounting? Uh, it was 2020, not too many uh, publicly com- uh, not too many companies did it now it seems like a lot of companies have already played that playbook how easy or hard was the transitioning time so from a tax perspective and accounting perspective uh, i uh, i don't really have much to say because we didn't sell any bitcoin so we didn't incur any taxable events um, as long as you're just buying bitcoin um, you don't have to worry about that at all um, that question sort of arises when when you want to sell it. Um, so I guess I'll have to look into that more when we actually decide to sell some. Uh, however, accounting wise, um, managing how much you buy as a business uh, can be a little tricky, um, especially when you feel the FOMO, right? Uh, you have to have discipline uh, when you're managing a company so that you're not eating into your working capital. A company like ours can can have like surprise expenses and, um, you know, we got payroll and we got any, all the expenses that come with just running a company. Uh, so the way we did it was we have six months of working capital. Uh, we decide what that is. We include uh, a provision for uh, some extra cash if we would need it and that just gets stored as cash and then everything outside of that that is our bitcoin so that's basically the way we do the accounting for it Uh, so we have that number set the six months working capital and you know it's a variable number it also grows as the company grows however uh, we know that number and then anything beyond that, we just buy Bitcoin with it and send it to cold storage. I love that a lot. Is that the main difference uh, between buying Bitcoin privately? Because like privately, you might have a business, uh, you might have a family, but uh, you, you don't have to be as cautious as with <laughs> with, the, with the business where there are like a lot of payrolls, a lot of uh, liability, uh, a lot of responsibilities involved. Is that the main difference between buying as a private Ali versus buying as Tahinis? I would say so. However, like the principle is still the same because even if you're buying person personally, um, your family and yourself, you guys have expenses and you need to calculate for all of these expenses over whatever period you decide, three months, four months, six months, and have that cushion uh, just in case for emergencies. And, um, and then anything beyond that, that's that's the money that you should be investing because you want to invest in a way, whether it's individually or in a company, where you're not a forced seller uh, of Bitcoin at any time. So, like, for example, for me personally, I went through a period, you know, over the last four years where I was sort of like tight on, on uh, cash and I didn't have to sell any Bitcoin to fix that because I had some cushion available for emergencies like that. And that's, that's the ultimate goal you want to be. Um, and thank God I was able to calculate it that way because that was a time when uh, Bitcoin was like at, at the lowest low of the bear market. Right. I think it was like at 20,000 or something like that. So uh, it's, I think it's personally, I think it's wise to account for these uh, events so that 
you can really take advantage of Bitcoin's superpower. And Bitcoin's superpower is not, you know, paying for a coffee. Bitcoin's superpower is um, saving for your retirement. And that's the way I see it, at least. That's interesting. Uh, there's also like uh, when you discussed with, with the FOMO and I think uh, no matter if you're a company or like an individual, you get a lot of FOMO. Uh, I think Michael Saylor even described it that like once he figured it out, he got a real big FOMO uh, because he's like, oh shit, when I can figure it out, all the CEOs can figure it out really quickly. Um, and then you get into the, the situation where like, okay, if I can borrow some money or I can borrow money against my future cash flows or against my assets that I have. Um, then I can buy Bitcoin now if it shoots up the next few years. How do you see that? Like, how do you, do you think that's a, a good decision, whether it's from business perspective or private perspective? Uh, did Tahini's ever consider that or do that? Uh, I mean, Michael Saylor, I know, does something. It, that's over my head what he does with the notes and, and with the loans. Like, I have no clue what he does. I just see that he stacks more and more Bitcoin. Uh, but how, how do you think about that powering to topic as a company or as an in individual? I mean, Michael Saylor talks about that very eloquently. Uh, I think if you're, if you believe in something and if you love something um, enough, um, you can figure out a way to take uh, smart leverage. And that's the key uh, word here is smart leverage and uh, use it to buy Bitcoin. So an example for smart leverage um, is, you know, taking a fixed uh, loan, a fixed rate loan from the bank through um maybe like putting your company or your or your home as collateral um rather than taking a credit card loan that's like 30 percent and could go up with the increase of interest rates or uh or a loan that could be uh margin called um if if things hit the fan and you know you end up being a forced seller at the worst possible time that's where people get wiped out the most. Uh, so we try to stay away from these uh, things, um, partly because not comfortable um, with the risk at this stage of our company. We have a lot of families to take care of. We have a lot of responsibilities. Um, we believe in Bitcoin 100%, but um, uh, we're trying to just be more conservative from that end. Um, Personally, though, it's a different story. So, yeah, I mean, it, I think it's a, it's a good idea if you're playing it smart and for the long term. Um, but for your business, it really depends on your tolerance risk and your your confidence in, in that strategy. Probably also a maturity of the business question, like a micro strategy has already... It, proven so long that they can have the cash flow and they have such a big business model with so many different uh, diversifications that like that's that's a way easier plan and, and also they're like 50 accountants and tax consultants that, that have through that decision uh, which is exactly the, yeah that's a very good point because like you know with a with a small business like ours uh, there's a risk that our our business uh, can can go through a tough time and and you know we wouldn't be like if we would take um, a debt that we wouldn't be able to service at a tough time uh, it could be catastrophic for a, a small company like ours um, where Michael Saylor's uh, micro strategy was a stable cash cow that was generating income at a steady base with a you know with a sl small increase year over year, but um, nothing too risky about the cash flows. Uh, so that's something else that you're absolutely right should be into consideration when you're making a decision like that. Now to the fun part. Um, you said that buying Bitcoin in or like putting Bitcoin on the as a reserve asset, like on, on a balance sheet in 2020 was an amazing decision for you and for the company. Um, why is that? Like what, what did Tahini's gain uh, from that? Yeah. So, I mean, you can just open the chart if you guys are watching uh, or listening uh, to this podcast, uh, open a chart and look back to the year 2020, um, August and before August, like Bitcoin was at $10,000 ish. 
um, at that period. And now it's at almost $60,000. Uh, the, the, this thing is crazy. And, uh, I'm of the belief that this thing will continue, uh, getting crazier and crazier because, um, it's just math, right? It's, it's, you know, when you really study it and go down the rabbit hole, you realize that, uh, absolute scarcity has never been invented before which means we still don't understand how massive this, this thing truly is. Right. Um, Jeff Booth, uh, which is a friend of mine, um, gives an example of a, you know, how people don't understand exponential change. Right. And he gives an example of like, if you bring a, a, a four size of paper, right. And this paper, you can only, Technically, you can only bend it like 11 times before it gets too hard to, to fold. But theor theoretically, if you could fold it 50 times on itself, uh, how high would that piece of paper be? And he was saying most people answers, most people answer like, you know, maybe from here to the ceiling or, or this much or, or whatever. And the true answer is from here to the sun. And I think that is how we should look at, at Bitcoin. We don't truly understand how big this thing can get. Um, as bullish as I am, I think Bitcoin within the next 10 years is going to be priced in the millions uh, within within our lifetimes, right? That's, uh, that is might be an underestimation of, of how high this thing could actually go because we've never seen absolute scarcity before. We've never seen explosive, the, the explosion of the current global debt economy when it's being pinned and gauged by an absolute fixed global decentralized digital asset. So when you just start thinking about these, these things, um, and, and you say, oh, yeah, it could be, you know, priced in the millions within 10 years. It could be priced way more than that. And, and that is what's going to protect you, your family, your business, your organization, and uh, probably your, your grandchildren as well, right? Uh, we, live in a, we live in a time where people are getting screwed by central banks. And let's be honest here, that's, that's just, that's been happening for uh, centuries and it's nothing new and will continue to happen for the future until we die and until our grandchildren die. And un up until this moment, up until 2008, um, there was nothing for the regular folk like you, me, everyone, billions of people all over the world to fight that to stop governments and central banks from stealing from us to go fund wars and whatever they want to fund. And this is a way to protect yourself, uh, even from the strongest entity out there. And uh, it's something that everybody should think about because we come from a world where we've seen what capital controls is like. We've seen um, people break into banks with guns, not robbing the bank, but demanding the bank that they'd give them their money, right? And that's Lebanon for you just a year ago, right? We we came from a world where my parents had money in Egypt and they couldn't, they wanted to retire here in Canada. They could not move their money from Egypt to Canada. Their money was stuck for about five years. And in those five years, the Egyptian pound got devalued 65%. So people in the West, Europe, North America, I feel like they, they, they live in this bubble and they think that, oh, everything that's happening over there, that's just over there. That could never happen to us. And we've just seen the de devaluation of our currency in just in the last four years against pretty much everything. Um, and 
you know, what comes after that is just, we've seen it. It's more devaluation, eventually capital controls, eventually, you know, you can spend on your money on this, but not on this. And eventually everything collapses and people tend to just deal and transact on in the real market, what, what is called the, the, the black market, but the black market is real market, you know, and the black market is where um, people end up just choosing a different kind of money. And that pretty much coincides and, and confirms uh, Gresham's law, which is, you know, money tends to flow to the most scarce and hardest money. So that's our two cents. It's a bit gloom, but hopeful. Gloom and doom in the sense that there's more theft and more um, inflation and more capital controls and more interest rate hikes on the way. And the interest rate hikes are going to hurt a lot of people, but it's going to also come with the basement. That's the next part that we haven't seen. If you look at I mean, Argentina or Egypt or Lebanon, all these places have like interest rates of like 20% or higher and, and with debasement, right? So imagine that happening in, in Europe. I think eventually we'll, we'll get there. So there's a lot of doom and gloom. People need to know about it. They need to be prepared. They, they need to think from first principles. They, they need to think that this could happen to them. And it probably will. And they need to see and find a solution. Hey, if you don't, if you don't want to believe me that Bitcoin is a solution, go do your homework, find something else. Good luck. I hope you're, you're right. And you're successful. I found Bitcoin. We've all found the Bitcoin community has been screaming this, you know, for years, for decades. And some people were, were just got, got here earlier than others. And, and if you're going to be, you know, if you don't want to believe that, good luck to you. And um, I wish you all the best. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your Bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship set up you have to talk to the bitcoin way if you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin. Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing coin vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time, but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way. It's interesting. Because I think you have an amazing uh, insight in like what that could bring uh, for, for for small businesses. Um, let's make that experiment 
what do you think happens to small and medium sized businesses when they just operate in the fiat system or maybe even with your uh, uh, restaurant uh, franchise? What would have happened to tahinis um, without Bitcoin? And why do then and like why do then uh, b businesses struggle so much? We'd just be a lot poorer, right? Uh, eventually, like. There's a lot of people that say, oh, Bitcoin fixes everything. Bitcoin is not going to fix your, your, your business skills. Bitcoin is not going to fix your marketing skills or operational skills or, you know, your, your financial accounting and management for the company skills, right? It's not, it's not going to uh, make your company successful, but it'll make, it'll give your company capital. And capital is, is a source for which you can use it to do anything. You can use it to hire experts. You can use it to buy assets to the company. You can use it to buy technology to the company. Um, you can use money for anything. So if you want to have two businesses that are exactly the same operational wise, they bring in the exact same revenue, exact same profit margins, but one has shit ton of Bitcoin that they've accumulated over the years and one has no Bitcoin at all. Which one would you prefer? Easy, easy choice. I definitely yep. run with the Bitcoin. Yeah, absolutely. Did you orange pill also already other businesses and, and, and founders and how does it go? I, I'd like to think so. I feel like we've influenced more people online and on Twitter than in actual real life. Um, We've orange pilled uh, almost everybody in the Tahini's headquarters. Um, so all of our employees and all stuff like that, we uh, we do incentive programs within the company using Bitcoin, right? So when we do uh, contests and parties and games and and like you know um, achievements, we, when we want to reward achievements, uh, we usually use Bitcoin to to sort of reward that and then uh, over time we started doing that like in small amounts you know in small amounts like you know twenty dollars in bitcoin here and twenty dollars there like little things like that over time you see you know i see like all the employees they come up to me and they're like ali like my bitcoin's now this much my bitcoin's now this much and it's pretty awesome to watch um i think just from experience, like giving people Bitcoin um, is one of the best ways to orange fill them. It doesn't work every time because some people lose it, unfortunately. I've, I've seen that uh, firsthand a lot of times, but a lot of times it does work. And a lot of times uh, you give somebody some Bitcoin and they follow it and they see it go up and they're like, oh, this thing is interesting. And they do their homework and they figure out how to buy more and then they buy more and then and then they come back and ask you about it or they come tell you, Hey, we made a lot of money on it, which is uh, pretty nice. I can understand why Bitcoiners in the early days used to give out a lot of Bitcoin. Uh, at first I thought, man, these guys are so dumb. Why would they get out like all this Bitcoin? But at that time it's, it's their way of, of, you know, marketing Bitcoin and, and, advocating for Bitcoin and, and, you know, trying to get their friends and family into Bitcoin. So I get it now. Yeah, it's interesting. I asked two days ago, Max Kaiser, um, if he's regretting uh, giving away Bitcoin because he did it from like 2011, 12 uh, onwards, where like Bitcoin was like you, you could give away to a friend like uh, a thousand Bitcoins and it would not really make a difference. Uh, and it's, it's an interesting, he's like, uh, it's, it's amazing to see the joy now in their lives and how the lives improved and how amazing that worked for them. But he's like, yeah, fuck yeah, I regret that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like a lot of money that he, he gave away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was giving away Max's. I, I love Max. He's, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, but he's he was crazy, man. He was he, he gave like Alex Jones, I think, like ten thousand Bitcoin, uh, and he used to give people like Bitcoin in the thousands back in the day. And and 
that's just the way he is. I feel like back then he was like one of like a hundred people on the planet that, you know, used to advocate about Bitcoin. Right. So, um, uh, Max is, is one of my favorite OGs. He is, uh, a personality of his own. He's a, he's a first principles thinker. He doesn't give a, a, a shit about, uh, governments or companies or this or that he truly says what's on his mind and he's a uh, he's i'm lucky we are all lucky to have max in the bitcoin community and um have him be a part of it so if you're watching us max i love you <laughs> it's so great yeah he was two days ago on my, on my podcast the first time ever I'm, I'm glad that he also came on my show uh, really cool uh, you also said bitcoin etms you have in in your restaurant why did you deploy those and what's the what's the game plan here yeah so after we bought bitcoin um we tried to figure out what other ways uh can we sort of integrate bitcoin with our business um, so we looked at payments and payments, you know, the way our company is structured and having franchisees, which operate as separate businesses, um, payments is a little bit trickier, um, unless we get, you know, all of them to voluntarily opt in. Uh, so we, we started thinking about what other ways could we integrate Bitcoin to the company. And, um, I met a company, um, called Bitcoin well up in Canada and Bitcoin well offers Bitcoin machines for businesses and they pay them rent. And that rent is either in cash or in Bitcoin. And I talked to the company, uh, and we made a deal and we started putting Bitcoin ATMs in our restaurants. I think now we have, uh, I think about 11 Bitcoin ATM machines. Uh, across our 44. So not every store has a Bitcoin ATM machine. It's up to that company to decide whether they want to put one or not. But then we got an extra stream of revenue that just comes in Bitcoin. And to show you how powerful that is, uh, Robin. So I'll just give you an example for one of those machines. Okay. So that company pays us $250 in Bitcoin every month. Okay. And one of those machines was installed three years and like four months ago. So three years and four months ago. So if you do the math, if you would have just received that money in fiat in dollars, you would have had around $10,000. Okay. But because we received that rent money in Bitcoin for that one machine, for that one restaurant, that account has now grown to 20, around $25,000 in Bitcoin. And that's just from holding it three and a half years. And I expect within the next year, it's probably going to be like 50,000 or something crazy like that. So compare that to just earning $10,000 over a three year period. That's the power of Bitcoin, right? So if you guys can find any way to integrate Bitcoin um, in your business, whether it's through payments or ATMs or any other way, a way where you can just earn more Bitcoin um, and keep it. And that's the key because a lot of businesses out there, they're like, Oh yeah, we accept Bitcoin, but we'll accept it and then sell it for dollars right away. That's just like adding another payment card. That's just having like Visa, MasterCard and Bitcoin, right? It's not really, you're not going to gain anything out of it. So find a way to earn more Bitcoin and keep it on your balance sheet for the long term. And that's, that's the true power of Bitcoin in my mind. That's why I also now accept from all my sponsors uh, payments in Bitcoin. <laughs> the only problem, I, the, the only problem I, I run into probably really soon to figure out how to pay my bills because I, I don't have fiat left and now my payments also come in Bitcoin, which is an amazing thing because like you save on the exchange fees 
you get the, the thing directly in your account and there's no better feeling like that. It, it feels so good to be like, oh, just got paid in it's Bitcoin. The best. I love it so yeah. much. Really it's cool. the best. And, and Bitcoin payments, you said, is, is not possible because of the franchisee um, model. So basically all the franchisees would have to opt in uh, in, the, in, the, in the payments model. So no tahinis uh, uh, that accepts Bitcoin right now. Yeah. I mean, it is possible. It's just very complicated to do. And, you know, a lot of, you know, if you would accept it and you want to sell it, the accounting for the taxes at that point becomes very difficult for these individual restaurants. Uh, and it, it's doable. It's actually easier to be done if you just own the one restaurant or the one store or two, you know, if you own two stores individually and, and you want to accept Bitcoin, it's a lot easier. But when you're running uh, for a franchise company like ours, it gets a little bit more complicated. However, for all of you out there, because we've been um, screamed at and yelled at by the Bitcoin community, uh, why don't you accept Bitcoin? We are working on something. Stay tuned, everyone. And um, it's just, it's complicated and needs time. So uh, all I'm going to say is just stay tuned. Really cool. So bro, m maybe Bitcoin payments in Tahini soon. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Really cool. Um, <laughs> one thing that um, uh, I also had a podcast around that, I don't know if you know Matthew Lusiak, uh, the author of Fiat Food, um, which is also interesting because you're a restaurant owner who has uh, adopted a Bitcoin standard. Um, how, do you think that's, that's, first of all, besides your restaurant, is that a thing, uh, Fiat Food, where, where you see like because of the money, our food got worse over time and, and the sound money system could actually make in general our food healthier or do you think that's just uh, human psychology and has nothing to do with money? I have to read the book. I haven't read the book Fiat Food. Uh, I'd have to fully read it. My gut instinct though tells me in a free market, competition drives price down and whether that's on a sound money standard like Bitcoin or on a fiat money standard, that's probably going to still be the case. And the way, the ways restaurants, uh, in general, try to try to get more business and compete with others is through driving price down and cost cutting and shrinkflation and, and, uh, you know, lowering the quality of food and stuff like that. Um, so I think I'm hopeful that it could change some of the structural things at the top. Like, you know, I, I, I'm not really sure. I don't, I don't really know. I don't think it will make that big of a change, but again, I could be wrong on this one. I'd have to read the other side and, and see what the other side is saying before I could really give an opinion. But as, as a guy who runs a food company, um, we try so like i said there's there's you know the ways you compete in in food is mainly through price you'll see companies do campaigns beyond and behind those campaigns are like five dollar meals and and four dollar meals and two dollar sandwiches and this and that that's how they compete and you know i know this because we you know we took a decision to sort of try to compete on the other side on what you get side of the equation. Cause you can, you can compete on, on, you know, what you pay side of the equation or what the, what, what the customer pays and you can compete on what the, the value the customer gets. So we've decided to go to attack the value of what the customer gets through, you know, great customer service. Um, little touches on the food, little touches on uh, the, the brand and the way the brand is being portrayed and, and, um, and all of these little things in the packaging and the, you know, the, the little things we do for our guests, whether it's thank you notes or a nice smile or 
or just making them feel good. And uh, this is the approach that we've chosen. However, most people in the industry choose the other side. And eventually uh, that drives all the bad food habits in our industry. Uh, so it could be, but I don't think so. It's interesting. I definitely can recommend it. Uh, Co-off is also Saifedi Namus, uh, Fiat Food. Uh, go, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting read um, and can definitely recommend it. But uh, I do think so, because I think in the Bitcoin community, we have a little bit the tendency of like, oh, Bitcoin fixes everything. And I think that's a little bit too extreme. Uh, Bitcoin fixes money most foremost uh, and money is so fundamental to our lives that yes it touches a lot but humans are still humans <laughs> and the psychology and these things uh, play into it a, a, a lot um, now we come to the end routine of the podcast where we have two questions the first question is always the same question for every guest uh, what can we learn from you besides bitcoin um i'd say um Really good at so so I'm I'm the chief marketing officer for the company. Um, I would say I'm pretty good at marketing. So I mean, if you wanna just as a short answer, um, if if you wanna see the results of some of the stuff that my, myself and my team have done, uh, just go to our YouTube channel, and uh, we were able to through creativity and and creative marketing tactics, uh, we were able to amass uh, around 3 million subscribers for a small food company. Um, that is more than McDonald's, Chipotle, Chick-fil-A, and Burger King combined. So um, that's pretty cool, <laughs> I think. Um, I can... I, I think, you know, if you want to, I don't want to like keep talking about what we do, but it's, it's very complicated, but I make it look kind of simple with the results. So go check out our YouTube channel and, and while you're at it, give us a subscribe and check out our stuff and see how we were able to do that and um, check our, our shorts section. That's where most of our work has, has gone and also TikTok and all the other avenues. And, um, so yeah, that's that would be a good one. That's a really impressive. I also saw the YouTube channel. I was like, wow, that's a that's a a big YouTube channel for uh, like it's it's like a something you would expect from like McDonald's or Burger King from like a established really big business. But like you're doing an an amazing job in in promoting uh, uh, tahinis. Really, really cool. Loved it a lot. Um, now Thanks, our Robin. second question of of the uh, end routine. Uh, the question comes from the previous guest, uh, and uh, with, uh, he, the previous guest gives the question to the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Uh, and the question is, what's the difference between Bitcoin and a living organism? Difference? Wow, that's a <laughs> that's a deep one. You know, I I think Bitcoin is is like a, if you were to compare it to a living organism, it would be similar to comparing it like to plankton in the ocean or ants or, or you know, uh, insects, something like that, where, you know, it's, it's built in a way, the structure is built in a way where you could throw a nuclear bomb in, in the ocean, in, in the most dense plankton uh, part of the ocean and you wouldn't affect like 0.05% of all the plankton in the world. Or if you drop a nuclear bomb on, and, uh, on an area that's filled with ants, for example, you still wouldn't kill all, you know, 0.01% of the ants of the world. Right. Um, I think it's comparable to something like that. And basically indestructible through decentralization and infrastructure and you know no there's no one central point of failure uh when it comes to ants right uh so i think that that's a good way of sort of comparing them to each other really really cool i i loved it a lot um thank you so much uh, ali for being on uh 
I, I already, uh, you already shouted out your, your YouTube channel. Is there any other way they, they can reach out to you and, and, and find your stuff? Wait, do I get to ask a question for the second person? Yes, uh, I usually do it <laughs> offline, but you can do it right now. Also. Okay. Okay, we'll do it offline. Perfect, okay. perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so other than that, um, we make pretty good food, guys. If there's a tahinis, uh, sorry about that. If there's a tahinis uh, near you, uh, come be our guest. We'd love to serve you some amazing food, and we'd, we'd be honored to have you as a guest. Um, for all of our Twitter, uh, sorry, for all of our Bitcoin updates and the platform where we talk about Bitcoin is Twitter. Uh, we don't talk about it on the other platforms. So if you want to, um, learn more about our uh, Bitcoin journey and learn more on how we did it, follow us on Twitter at the real Tahinis. And, uh, we love you guys. Um, we're doing this to try to help people. Um, you know, our, our, Businesses revolved around making people happy. And I also like to try to make people safe financially while I'm at it. So um, that's it. You know, nothing more. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Ali, for being on my show. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening. Uh, as always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Take care.